Good evening everyone, I'm Alma Angeles and you're watching Net25 World News. Here are tonight's top stories. Australia and the Philippines are joining forces for a joint maritime exercise with Japan, New Zealand and the U.S. also participating. This drill will take place within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone and compassing some of the most disputed waters in Asia. Hurricane Helene has wreaked havoc across the Florida Panhandle, marking its status as the strongest storm to ever strike the Big Bend region. While communities here have faced hurricanes in the past, none have matched the ferocity of Helene. And then the early reports we've received is that the, the damage in, in those counties that were really in the, the eye of the storm uh, has exceeded the damage of Idalia and Debbie combined. Explosion shook central Beirut today just before sunset, causing significant damage to multiple residential buildings. The exact number of casualties remains unknown, but reports suggest that Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah was the intended target of the strikes and his condition is currently unconfirmed. We are preparing to conduct strikes on strategic assets that Hezbollah has hidden underground beneath three buildings in the heart of the Dakhia in Beirut. Descending to the parking level, there is a storage facility for strategic weapons. The news starts now. Hurricane Helene has left a path of destruction across the Florida panhandle, becoming the most powerful storm to ever hit the Big Bend region. Communities here have weathered hurricanes before, but none have been as strong as Helene. With the water on Davis Island, our high rescue vehicles can't even get on Davis Island. So that's, you know, that flooding was what we had warned everyone about. So Buildings that withstood previous storms were simply no match for this Category 4 monster. Winds reached 140 miles per hour, and some areas received up to 14 inches of rain. And then the early reports we've received is that the, the damage in, in those counties that were really in the, the eye of the storm uh, has exceeded the damage of Idalia and Debbie combined. You are seeing a significantly more storm, storm surge in places like Tampa Bay. Uh, we also saw major storm surge, of course, in the Big Bend region. Amidst the chaos, the U.S. Coast Guard heroically rescued a man and his dog from a, a disabled sailboat off Sanibel Island. Further inland, rising floodwaters trapped dozens of patients and staff on a hospital roof in Irwin, Tennessee. Police aviation units used helicopters to safely evacuate everyone. Drone footage reveals the devastation on Florida's west coast, with widespread flooding and waterfront areas completely destroyed by the storm surge. This is the worst. Ain't nothing even come close to it. It floated my house. Holly, can you help me? <laughs> it's the worst ever. The 95, the, my grandmother lived right there, and she said the storm, of the, the worst storm that come here was in 35. Water never come over her house. Then. And when you're talking about storm surge of this magnitude, I mean, we, we think we talked to some folks that, that think it went 20 feet uh, where the stuff's just getting washed out. Uh, that's really, really devastating. So there's going to be a lot of work to do. The storm's impact is not limited to Florida. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp warned residents to stay indoors after widespread destruction and flooding swept through the state. For people in the metro area, it is still very dangerous out there. The loss of life that we've seen, uh, a lot of it has been by fallen trees because of saturated ground. And even though the winds are starting to die down, there's still trees literally falling. One fell at the mansion across the driveway after we left this morning uh, and basically before we got here to the state operations center. Uh, we're continuing to see that in the metro area, and I know we'll see that in north uh, east Georgia as well. We also have the potential for uh, flash flooding, uh, and the waters are going to continue to rise for the next 24 to potentially 48 hours, especially on the northern part of the state. So if you're out, you need to be weather aware. If you don't have to get out, I would just tell you to try to hunker down uh, at the house or 
you know, limit your activities. Sadly, Governor Kemp confirmed two deaths in Wheeler County from a tornado spawned by the hurricane. Millions are without power across the region. Data from PowerOutage.us shows roughly one million homes and businesses in Georgia are in the dark, with the total number affected across several states, including Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, reaching nearly 4.4 million people. Meanwhile, Storm John weakened to a tropical depression on Friday as it dissipated over Mexico's Pacific coast, but not before dumping nearly 100 centimeters or 39 inches of rain on the southern state of Guerrero. For four days, heavy rain drenched Guerrero, home to the popular beach resort of Acapulco, nearly tripling the rainfall from last year's devastating hurricane Otis, according to Mexican officials. Las calles están vacías, este, cerradas, los puentes caídos y pues, el, el temporal no deja, no deja que una circulación segura. Images circulating online showed homes, businesses, roads and cars submerged as floodwaters rose in Guerrero and the neighboring state of Michoacan. The U.S. National Hurricane Center warned that catastrophic flash flooding and mudslides would continue in southern and southwestern Mexico. Alejandra Mendez, head of the Mexico's National Meteorological Service, said Storm John brought more than 95 centimeters or 37 inches of rain to Guerrero, while last year's Category 5 hurricane Otis brought about 35 centimeters, which claimed over 50 lives and caused $15 billion in damages and, and had rapidly intensified near Acapulco. In contrast, John moved more slowly, alternating between tropical storm and hurricane, saturating a broad area along the coast. By Friday afternoon, Storm John was located 90 miles west of Lazaro Cardenas, a key cargo port north of Guerrero, moving slowly at just 5 miles per hour. And the storm hit Guerrero twice with hurricane strength after regenerating offshore, earning the nickname Zombie Storm from meteorologists. Australia and the Philippines are teaming up for a joint maritime exercise and they're bringing along Japan, New Zealand and the United States. The drill will take place in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, which includes some of the most hotly contested waters in Asia. In a statement, Australia's Department of Defense said the exercise is about showing a united front, strengthening cooperation and promoting peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. The Australian Navy's HMAS Sydney and Royal Australian Air Force patrol plane will be working with their partners to boost teamwork and coordination between their armed forces. This joint exercise comes on the heels of rising tensions between the Philippines and China over disputed areas in the South China Sea including the Scarborough Shoal, which China's Coast Guard has controlled for more than a decade. Earlier this week, Australian and New Zealand naval ships sailed through the Taiwan Strait, another hot spot in the South China Sea. Australia's Defense Department said it was a show of commitment to keeping the region open and stable. China, however, claims it has sovereignty over the Taiwan Strait and much of the South China Sea. But both the U.S. and Taiwan view the strait as an international waterway that's critical for global trade. Australia's Foreign Minister Penny Wong weighed in during a speech at the U.N. General Assembly calling for peace and stability in the region. Australia has a different vision for the world one where no country dominates and no country is dominated. When disputes inevitably arise, we insist those differences are managed through dialogue and according to the rules, not simply by force or raw power. It's why we have consistently pressed China on peace and stability in the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait, and why we have welcomed the resumption of leader and military level dialogue between the United States and China. Some countries may dismiss the rules as a Western construct. Well, our Asia-Pacific region tells a different story. Take the agreement between Vietnam and Indonesia to delimit their exclusive economic zone after 12 years of negotiations, an example of how long-standing maritime disputes can be resolved in accordance with international law. 
Israel launched major airstrikes on Beirut's outskirts Friday, targeting Hezbollah's headquarters. Massive plumes of smoke rose as Israeli media reported Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah as the main target. Explosions rocked central Beirut today just before sunset, causing significant damage to several residential buildings. The exact death toll remains unclear, but sources indicate that Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah was the target of the strike. In southern Beirut, multiple massive blasts sent thick plumes of smoke billowing into the sky and healthy parts of the Lebanese capital. Reports indicate that six high-rise buildings were bombed, leaving them in ruins. Israel confirmed it conducted a precise strike targeting Hezbollah headquarters, which it claims is located beneath residential structures in the densely populated Dahiyya neighborhood. We are preparing to conduct strikes on strategic assets that Hezbollah has hidden underground beneath three buildings in the heart of the Dahiyya in Beirut. Descending to the parking level, there is a storage facility for strategic weapons. Hezbollah has stored these strategic weapons beneath civilian populations. The way the missiles are stored in these buildings allows them to be moved and launched with outside of the buildings within minutes. In a short time, we will attack the weapons stored beneath the buildings. The explosion, because of the missiles, may damage the structure and could potentially cause them to collapse. The U.S. had no prior knowledge of the Beirut strike. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin told reporters. But you're seeing uh, reports of a significant strike in Be Beirut today. Uh, I spoke by phone earlier with my counterpart uh, in Israel, Minister Gallant. The United States was not involved in Israel's operation. We had no advance warning. My call with Minister Gallant took place uh, while the operation was actually uh, un already underway. What I will say is that you've heard me say a number of times that an all-out war should be avoided. Diplomacy continues to be the best way forward. And it's the fastest way to let displaced Israeli and Lebanese citizens return to their homes on both sides of the border. I'll be talking with Minister Gallant again soon, and I look to get an update from him uh, when, I, when we have that conversation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressing the UN General Assembly in New York at the same time defended Israel's military actions in Lebanon. I decided to come here to speak for my people, to speak for my country, to speak for the truth. And here's the truth. Israel seeks peace. Israel yearns for peace. Israel has made peace and will make peace again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the curse of October 7th began when Hamas invaded Israel from Gaza, but it didn't end there. Israel was soon forced to defend itself on six more war fronts organized by Iran. I have a message for the tyrants of Tehran. If you strike us, we will strike you. There is no place. There is no place in Iran that the long arm of Israel cannot reach. And that's true of the entire Middle East. As long as Hezbollah chooses the path of war, Israel has no choice and Israel has every right to remove this threat and return our citizens to their homes safely. And that's exactly what we're doing. In remarks to the UN General Assembly, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken highlighted the critical decisions facing the Middle East in the coming days, stressing the importance of diplomacy over conflict. The events of the past week and the past few hours underscore what a precarious moment this is for the Middle East and for the world. 
Israel has the right to defend itself against terrorism. The way it does so matters. The choices that all parties make in the coming days will determine which path this region is on. The United States has made clear, along with the G7, the European Union, partners in the Gulf, so many other regions, that we believe the way forward is through diplomacy, not conflict. I also want to be clear that anyone using this moment to target American personnel, American interests in the region, the United States will take every measure to defend our people. Blinken also mentioned his candid and in-depth conversation with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. I also underscored our strong concern with China's support for Russia's defense industrial base, which fuels Russia's war machine and perpetuates a war that China purports to want to see ended. So when Beijing says that on the one hand that it, it wants peace, it wants to see an end to the conflict, but on the other hand is allowing its companies to take actions that are actually helping Putin continue the aggression, that doesn't add up. And raised issues about China's dangerous and destabilizing actions in the South China Sea. But we also agreed on the importance of the leaders communicating. Uh, and so I fully uh, anticipate that you know, we'll see that in the weeks and months ahead. At the Security Council on Tuesday, the overwhelming majority of countries condemned Russia's brutal war of conquest and called for a just and lasting peace on the basis of the United Nations Charter. Crucial to that is pressing Iran, North Korea, and China, a permanent member of the Council, to stop providing weapons, artillery, machinery, and other support that Putin is using to devastate Ukrainian homes, energy grids, and ports. Thank you. Thank you all. Vice President Kamala Harris made a significant move today, visiting the southern border for the first time as a presidential candidate, responding to challenges from Donald Trump. To reduce illegal border crossings, I will take further action to keep the border closed between ports of entry. Those who cross our borders unlawfully will be apprehended and removed and barred from re-entering for five years. We will pursue more severe criminal charges against repeat violators. And if someone does not make an asylum request at a legal point of entry and instead crosses our border unlawfully, they will be barred from receiving asylum. Well, it's great to be with you, and this has been a very interesting day. Some numbers came out. Let's give you the bad news first. The worst numbers I think I've ever heard. You know exactly what I'm talking about, with a lot of people being released into our country that should never, ever be here, right? Like nobody can believe, but I've been saying it for three and a half years because we are the party of common sense. We know, we really know what's going on. And coming out of jails, murderers at levels that nobody thought possible. And uh, it was all done by comrade Kamala Harris. The former president has been highly critical of the Biden administration's handling of immigration. And Harris used the trip to push back. Reporting from the critical battleground state of Arizona, Harris is making just her second visit to the U.S.-Mexico border since taking office. She hopes to close the gap with Trump on immigration by pledging to uphold the Biden administration's recent crackdown on asylum requests. I reject the false choice that suggests we must either choose between securing our border or creating a system of immigration that is safe orderly and humane. We can and we must do both. We must do both. And we need clear legal pathways for people seeking to come into our country. And we must make our current system work better. For example, it can take years for asylum claims to be decided. 
Well, this is a problem we can solve, including by hiring more asylum officers and expanding processing centers in people's home countries. And as President, I will work with Congress to create, at long last, a pathway to citizenship for hardworking immigrants who have been here for years. But unlike Kamala, who always complains and doesn't do anything, I, you know, I keep saying, why don't you do, I saw Marsha the other day, why doesn't she, why didn't she do it four years ago almost? And I say that, you know, she's on the border today, try and justify, what a day for the border. She goes to the border today, and they just announced just before she got up to speak, that more than 13,000 murderers from jail, solitary confinement people in many cases, were released. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited Washington, where President Joe Biden hosted him at the White House during their meeting. Biden unveiled a new military aid package for Ukraine valued at billions. Right now, right now we have to strengthen Ukraine's position on the battlefield. And that's why today I'm proud to announce a new $2.4 billion package of security assistance. I've also directed the Pentagon to allocate, to allocate all the remaining security assistance funding that has been appropriated to Ukraine, period. Zelensky presented his victory plan, although the specifics remain unclear. And I raised with President Biden the plan of victory. Today we are preparing to discuss the details to strengthen the plan coordinates our positions, views, and approaches. Our teams will work together to ensure the implementation. Reports suggest it includes increased military support and proposed peace summits, essentially continuing the current strategy. Following his meeting with Biden, Zelensky also met with Vice President Kamala Harris, where political tensions surfaced. While she didn't mention Donald Trump by name, Harris pointed remarks about those who would pressure Ukraine into ceding territory. However, in candor, I share with you, Mr. President, there are some in my country who would instead force Ukraine to give up large parts of its sovereign territory who would demand that Ukraine accept neutrality and would require Ukraine to forego security relationships with other nations. These proposals are the same of those of Putin. And let us be clear, they are not proposals for peace. Instead, they are proposals for surrender, which is dangerous and unacceptable. We have to end this war. We need a just peace and we must protect our people, Ukrainian families, Ukrainian children and everyone from Putin's civil. And we are grateful to America for supporting Ukraine. This political jab could complicate Zelensky's efforts to garner support not only from Democrats, but also from Republicans, who are crucial for continued military aid. Recently, Zelensky visited a weapons manufacturing facility in Pennsylvania, a critical swing state in U.S. elections, which has drawn criticism from the Trump camp, who branded it as a partisan event. The Speaker of the House even sent a letter to Zelensky requesting that he fire Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S., highlighting the increasing strain in U.S.-Ukraine relations at a delicate time. Well, listen, I, I sent a letter to um, President Zelensky today because the ambassador crossed the line, and, and I think she, uh, she involved him in that. They, they made a uh, campaign stop on behalf of the, of the Democratic Party and effectively have given a tacit endorsement uh, to Kamala Harris. That's not what we need our allies to be doing or any foreign nation. I think it's election interference and I think it's an, an unforgivable trespass and I think the ambassador uh, needs to take responsibility for that and be terminated. So I, I asked him to do that immediately. While Trump has expressed his intention to support Ukraine, he initially snubbed a meeting with Zelensky. However, they eventually met in New York. And so I appreciated that. So we have a very good relationship. And I also have a very good relationship, as you know, with President Putin. And I think uh, if we win, I think we're going to get it resolved very quickly. Very well. I really think we're going to get it I resolved. I hope we have more good relations. We're going to have. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think but, Ukraine but, you know, it takes two to tango, you know, and we will, uh, we're going to have a good meeting today. As the U.S. approaches its election on November 5th, 
Zelensky's future support hinges on the outcome. A win for Harris would likely mean continued backing. But if Trump takes office, the situation could drastically change. Many Trump supporters are skeptical of U.S. involvement in the conflict, questioning why American taxpayers should fund Ukraine's defense. A concern Zelensky has yet to address directly. As he heads back home, Zelensky leaves the U.S. with more uncertainty than clarity, despite his initial hopes for stronger support. New York Mayor Eric Adams entered a federal court and pleaded not guilty to bribery, to bribery and other charges. He faces allegations of accepting illegal campaign contributions and gifts from Turkish nationals in return for promoting Turkey's interests through his position. New York City Mayor Eric Adams on Friday pleaded not guilty to federal charges of accepting bribes and illegal campaign contributions from Turkish nationals. After entering his plea in a Manhattan federal court, his lawyer Alex Spiro told reporters he would file a motion to dismiss the charges next week. This case isn't even a real case. This is the airline upgrade corruption case. Adams was released without having to post any bail on the condition that he not have contact with witnesses or people named in the indictment. The judge said there would be exceptions for staff and family members, but he's not permitted to discuss the details of the indictment with them. Mayor Adams engaged in a long-running conspiracy in which he solicited and knowingly accepted illegal campaign contributions from foreign donors and corporations. In the indictment unsealed on Thursday, Federal prosecutors said Turkish diplomats and business people illegally funneled money to Adams' mayoral campaign. They allege Adams was showered with luxury travel perks, including business class airplane tickets, opulent hotel stays, and meals at high-end restaurants. Prosecutors said the mayor took the gifts, and in exchange, Adams in 2021 pressured city officials to allow Turkey's 36-story consulate to open despite safety concerns. A Turkish foreign ministry spokesperson said on Friday its diplomats adhered to protocol. There are no emails, text messages, or any corroboration whatsoever that the mayor knew about anything having to do with these campaign donations. The mayor's attorney on Friday said there was no evidence implicating Adams in the alleged bribery. Adams on Thursday said he had no plans to resign. The Justice Department has formally charged three members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard in connection with the alleged hacking of Donald Trump's presidential campaign. According to a comprehensive 37-page indictment, the individuals are accused of launching an extensive hacking campaign starting in 2020 that targeted U.S. officials, journalists, and campaign staff, aiming to undermine trust in the democratic process. They face 18 charges, including wire fraud and identity theft. The defendant's own words make clear that they were attempting to undermine former President Trump's campaign in advance of the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Iran's malign activities are wide-ranging. The U.S. government is intensely tracking Iran's lethal plotting against current and former U.S. government officials, including former President Trump. As the intelligence community has reported, we are seeing increasingly aggressive Iranian cyber activity during this election cycle. Last month, the Trump campaign reported a hacking incident attributed to Iranian actors, stating that sensitive internal documents had been stolen and leaked. The three individuals charged are believed to be living in Iran, making it unlikely they will ever stand trial in the United States. Is Elon Musk finally backing down in his fight against censorship? New documents suggest that X has compiled, has complied with Brazilian court orders and is now seeking to lift a ban on the platform. Elon Musk's X looks to have backed down in its battle with Brazil. Documents seen by Reuters show it has asked a judge to lift a national ban on the social network. X says it has now complied with orders to stop the spread of misinformation. If confirmed, that would mark a climb down by Musk who has been battling what he calls censorship. He's been engaged in a months-long feud with Supreme Court Justice Alexandra de Moraes. The judge has spearheaded a campaign against perceived attacks on democracy and the political use of disinformation. 
He shut down access to X in the country after it resisted complying with his orders. Then he froze Brazilian bank accounts for Starlink, another of Musk's businesses. The billionaire responded furiously, calling Morais a dictator. X then attempted to circumvent the ban using cloud services from third parties, but soon backed down amid the threat of heavy fines. It has since taken a series of conciliatory steps, including appointing a local representative, as demanded by the judge. A lot was at stake for the network, with Brazil its sixth largest market. In a statement Thursday, the firm said it respected the sovereignty of countries where it operated, but would defend free expression through due legal processes. In other news tonight, Myanmar's ruling military urged its armed opponents through a statement announced by the military-run state media MRTV to abandon what it called terrorism and join the political fold in a general election next year in an unexpected outreach to its enemies that was quickly rebuffed. Myanmar is locked in a civil war with the junta, fighting on multiple fronts against an armed resistance movement, the People's Defense Forces, which are loosely allied with several ethnic minority rebel groups with a bitter history with the military. The offer was the military's first olive branch to its rivals since its 2021 coup, having resisted international calls to enter into dialogue with what it insists are terrorists determined to destroy the country. Myanmar's shadow national unity government swiftly rejected the plea from military for its armed affiliates, the PDF, to abandon their rebellion and form a party. What lengths will climate activists go to make their voices heard? A recent incident at the National Gallery in London has sparked debate as members of Just Stop Oil targeted two of Vincent van Gogh's most famous works. Take a look. Three activists from Just Stop Oil threw soup at two of Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers paintings in London's National Gallery on Friday. Just after two members of the same group were sentenced to jail time for doing the same thing in 2022. In that incident, two members of the group threw tomato soup at a sunflowers painting and then glued themselves to a wall. What is worth more, art or life? That's Phoebe Plummer in the video. The now 23-year-old was handed a two-year prison sentence for a criminal damage charge, plus an additional three months for the relatively new offense of interfering with the use of key national infrastructure. We cannot afford new oil and gas. The other activist from 2022 was Anna Holland who was sentenced to 20 months. The pair had pleaded not guilty. Prosecutors said the soup toss caused over $13,000 worth of damage to the painting's frame. The work itself was behind a protective screen. It was undamaged and went back on display the same day. The judge said the pair had no right to do what they did, adding, quote, your arrogance in thinking otherwise deserves the strongest condemnation. Plummer said she was being made a political prisoner an assertion that drew a critical rebuke from the judge. There's been a wider crackdown on protest movements in Britain and across Europe. In July, five members of Just Stop Oil were jailed for at least four years for conspiracy to block London's M25 highway. They were the longest sentences ever imposed for a non-violent protest in Britain. Friday soup throwers targeted one Van Gogh painting owned by the London Gallery, the same one struck in 2022, and another on loan. The National Gallery said three people had been arrested and no damage had been done to the paintings. And finally, in our news, a beloved icon of stage and screen has passed away. Dame Maggie Smith, one of the finest actresses of her generation, leaves behind a legacy of unforgettable roles. For nearly 70 years, Dame Maggie Smith captivated audiences with her sharp wit and English charm. Being something on the stage at the National the other night was so extraordinary. From the stage to the screen, Smith showcased an impressive range of roles. 
She began her career on Broadway in the West End and at the Royal Shakespeare Company. I think I have to start with Maggie because she never misses a beat in those things. She always gets the line absolutely right. And that is, you know, as you can imagine, very, very uh, rewarding to write for because you know you're putting a dart into the hands of someone who'll hit the bullseye every time. However, it was her iconic roles in the 2000s that propelled her to international fame. Smith's portrayal of Professor Minerva McGonagall in the Harry Potter series and the Dowager Countess of Grantham in Downtown Abbey became beloved by millions. Earlier in her career, she earned an Academy Award for her role in the 1969 film The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Smith's accolades include Tony's, Emmys, BAFTAs, and another Academy Award. Smith was part of a celebrated generation of British stars, including Judi Dench, who humorously referred to themselves as the Dames. Dame Maggie Smith was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1990. She was 89 years old. Net 25, your trusted source for global news, keeping you informed every day. I'm Alma Angeles. We'll see you back on Monday. Good night.